All right, go, going to cluster architecture. So we talked about nodes and indices and charts and all that. Let's talk a little bit about how a cluster should look like or like typical patterns. We have data nodes, obviously. That's where the data is going to reside. We have master nodes. OpenSearch recently changed this. To, I'm too used to, to using master, so I'll just use master. So data nodes is where your data is stored, where queries are running, where ingestion is happening. Essentially, the, the beefier nodes need to be assigned the data node uh, role. And then we have master nodes. And a big misconception is that master nodes do a lot of work in the cluster. That's not true. Master nodes only maintain the cluster state. So we'll talk about cluster state la later on, but basically they only need to be always available. So not to, you should not reach out to them for actions or indexing or queries or anything like that. They should not participate in those things. They just need to be available. And in terms of sizing, they don't have to be that strong as well. You just need to be there and available. And we usually keep three of them. So we have a quorum. So we have enough. So we know exactly how the cluster is structured and, and we can create a quorum of decisions when changes need to happen. And then sometimes we have uh, coordinating nodes, clients. It's not a must, but sometimes it makes sense to deploy them. It's basically a way for us to delegate CPU work from data nodes to, to external nodes. And we'll talk about that. Uh, there's other roles as well. So we, we mentioned ingest nodes. So ingest nodes essentially are nodes that will run that CPU heavy ingestion pipelines. And it's a role on a, on a node. So essentially, you can have a data node that is ingest node. That's also the default, right? But if you want to run ingest heavy pipelines, maybe you want to create nodes that are ingest only nodes. And then data nodes are, do not have the ingest role. And then that, that's how you basically use open search for data processing and ingestion, but you don't really pay as much for it, right? So that's something we can do. And that's thanks to the way that OpenSearch structures the node roles. It's basically a role. If a node has a role, it can execute some specific tasks. So in terms of cluster topologies, by default, every node that you run is going to have all roles assigned to it because that's the default. So if you want to offload a role from a node, that, that you, you'll need to do that explicitly yourself. So if you run a single node, obviously it will have all the roles enabled. So if you want to start removing failure points, then you want to add a data node, right? Another data node. So you have another data node and that data node is going to be able to replicate data and then data is replicated between two, two nodes and then you don't have any failure point in terms of data, but you still have only one master node and one master node is still a risk. And also you have a, a mix between master and data nodes here. So the data node is also working as a master node. And that is also an issue. And it's issue, it's an issue because when you have a, when you have a data node fellow, the data node is working very hard, the master role is maybe going to be a start from resources. So it's not going to have enough resources to actually maintain cluster state and receive commands. And ping and respond to pings and do all the things that master nodes do. And that's why we usually like 99.9% .9 of time, we split master nodes from data nodes. Regardless, you need to have also more than one and more than two master nodes to avoid what we call the split brain situation. So you always need to have three, at least three uh, nodes that participate in voting. That's what we call it which is, voting is the process that happens every time some change needs to happen in the cluster. When you need to elect a new master node, or when a change needs to happen in the cluster, the master node is the only one that can make that decision. And the only way that we can elect a master node is we, if we have at least, if we have a quorum, if we have at least three machines voting, we can have less, but then the quorum is undefined. And so we want to have, have the quorum defined. That's why we have an option of either having three master nodes. We would recommend not deploying them with the data node. So they never get overwhelmed and starved for resources. And, but there is also a concept of a voting only node, all right? A voting only node can also be a data node, obviously. 
but then it's no, never going to be elected a master, but it is going to participate in voting. It's like a weekend master eligible node. And the idea is that this is how you can form a quorum and you can still give data nodes, have data nodes participate in voting, but they will not be elected master. So the recommendation would be to have a dedicated master node and that dedicated master node is going to have no data on it at all. But if you have a small cluster and you don't want to start deploying more, more nodes, you can have a voting only role assigned to your data node as well. Master only node doesn't need to have enough resource, a lot of resources, but if you have a master node with data node, it could be start from resources. Voting only does not have any resource requirements really. It, again, it's just a matter of, I'm going to respond to pings. It could be starving, start for resources as well, but I'm less worried about that because if I'm going to have enough voting nodes, it, it should be okay, re uh, relatively speaking. But again, for large clusters, you should really have dedicated master eligible nodes. Uh, it's, it's mainly a fix for uh, small clusters. Right, when, when with dedicated masters, again, the misconception is that master nodes are, because of the name probably, something that is important for the cluster to have and they manage the cluster and they, uh, ex they run, they execute operations and things that's not true. Again, all they do is maintain state. When your application is, is talking to the cluster, it needs to talk to data nodes or client nodes if you have them deployed, but never master nodes. Master nodes is only uh, inter-cluster communication and your application should never speak to them. So with, with regard to request coordination, that's the client nodes uh, that you don't have to have, but sometimes it can help. So the idea is that every, that's why I also told you never to send queries or uh, requests to the, to the master nodes. Every operation with Elasticsearch is specifically uh, search requests that an aggregation request that really do a lot of heavy lifting, but pretty much any request will we'll need to require some coordination. Now the cluster state is contains everything the, the node needs to know on how to do those things, right? So if, you, if I got a request searching for something, I know where those shards will exist. I know which nodes have those shards because the, the cluster state is distributed to all nodes. So the local node receiving the request already knows what to do, right? But then it needs to start executing those commands. So coordinating those requests requires some effort. And for example, in search requests, you will, it will end up uh, uh, scattering and gathering the, all the, the, the requests and getting the results back and scoring them. And so there's, there's a lot of work involved. That usually the data nodes are going to do that. And usually that's fine. Sometimes on large clusters, on clusters with very significant search traffic that is also very heavy and things like that, it makes sense to extract some CPU out of the data nodes and basically get dedicated coordinator nodes, client nodes usually called, that will do this request coordination for you. So you will basically run all search requests to the load balancer or to the IPs of the client nodes. And because they have their local cluster state, they know what to do. So they will do their thing, but they do not store any data and they do, are not responsible for cluster state. The only responsibility that they have is essentially getting requests from you and processing them. The reason why to do that is to not overload the data nodes, to, to basically get some operations done by CPU that is pretty much stateless. And by the way, we can even use spot instances for those things. It sometimes makes it even easier, easy to, easier to, do, to run those things. It's not really required for any cluster. It really, it's a matter of testing and all, only for very large and heavy clusters. It's worth testing for, but also a concept that's worth be familiar with. Cool. I'm going to skip that, but just briefly, OpenSearch has a, a lot of built-in stuff to try and optimize what we just discussed, coordinating responses and everything. So it will try to get to the right replica that is also closer and is on a less busy node. So it's called adaptive replica selection. There's a lot of brains going on trying to optimize that, but that's, for example, something we would monitor and try to optimize for. That's how I coordinate dedicated master nodes and obviously data nodes uh, constellation looks. And in terms of high availability, maybe one thing we should say explicitly 
the with open search you, you need to make a decision if you want to run kubernetes on multi az and then if you want want open search to also would be deployed on multi az and so on the is essentially when you are deployed multi az on a cloud you're going to pay a lot more right because of all the network traffic that's going to go be beyond be, between az's and that's basically what this slide is about open search will manage availability for you if you are deployed on even one single az you have and you have enough nodes as long as that az doesn't go down you should be safe because open search will replicate data for you adding another az will just make sure that on whenever there is a cloud partial or full failure on a specific az the clouds are built in a way I don't know about Azure. I've been a Microsoft MVP for, for many years. I never trusted Azure, but uh, I, I, I was there in Redmond in the building 33, I think it's called, and they, when they talked about Azure and I was telling them, can you please fix those pains in the Azure portal? I, I heard they finally did it. But anyway, Azure specific or any cloud will build the AZ in a way that will make sure that if one AZ fails, nothing will affect the other AZ, right? It's like separate buildings and, and everything. It should be very safe. So add, uh, deploying on multiple AZ should reduce the risk to, to almost zero over downtime, but it will increase the, the total cost. If you want to deploy uh, on multi-region, right? You should not deploy one cluster multi-region. That's for sure. You have to deploy multiple clusters because we cannot support um, the, the ping and, and connectivity and, and so on inter cluster on a multi-region setup, only multi-AZ. Okay, so that's basically that's what this slide is about. Uh, if you deploy multi-AZ, it's going to cost you more. Uh, depending on how you manage that, maybe there is some uh, maintenance cost associated with that. And the whole idea is to find that sweet spot that works for you, but that's, that's what it is about. Regardless, never deploy uh, one cluster on multi-region. Uh, we have customers doing that. Don't do that. Uh, that's okay. This is this slide. Uh, you do have course cluster replication. So you can basically take one cluster and uh, and make sure that it's fully synced with a different cluster or multiple uh, on different regions. And then you also have course cluster search if you do cluster sharding. So you have Europe cluster and US cluster and data, Europe data is only on here and US data is only on there. You can still query them in one go using course cluster search. So we have those features baked in and we can use them, but just so you know. The XPAC is, is not relevant. So course cluster replication was in Elasticsearch since 6.5 using XPAC. It's also available in open search built in. So as far as for open search node sizing, master nodes, like I said, the they don't do anything in the cluster. They're, they shouldn't really be oversized, but the since they maintain cluster state and the cluster state could get big on large clusters, you need enough memory to hold the cluster state. So I don't know what the cluster state is, but you really need to maintain it. So usually we go for four gigabytes. Sometimes you need eight gigabytes, sometimes more, but you don't really need more than two cores. So I feel comfortable in giving this advice but it's a rule of thumb and you should really look at your cluster and understand, okay? Uh, in terms of data nodes, this is, we'll talk about sizing of data nodes, but this is like really depends on data and usage and all that. Standard sizing is eight cores and 64 gigabytes of memory, which means the data node gets about 30 gigabytes of heap of Java space, but it really depends on, on what you're doing and uh, disk and memory ratio and whether or not we want to have bigger storage density, for example, because we are write heavy and we're okay with searches being sometimes slow or the other way around. So it really depends on, on those things. Uh, but this, this slide is here just to give you some idea on, on what to expect. In terms of sizing by data, again, it's like very broad, very high level, but those are usually the recommendation. We would do something like memory to disk ratio. And we would say that we would want to have one gigabyte of memory for every 20 gigabyte of disk for very high performance, because it will allow us to basically load a lot of stuff into memory and page cache and, and things like that. 
and will go higher on the ratio is as we basically prefer storage density and saving on costs uh, versus uh, search performance. It doesn't mean that search performance is going to be bad. It just means it we will be able to support less search in favor of saving money. And, but again, it's just very broad, very high level. On that respect, we, we can do something like that's called hot, warm, cold architecture. Hot, warm, cold architecture it allows you to basically do what I just mentioned. It's basically say something like ingestion needs to go to hot nodes because they can process that faster. And data that's frequently accessible, we want also on the hot nodes. But then we have data that is less accessible, let's say, last 24 hours need to be on hot warm hot cold hot tier and warm uh, will support last one last three days last week and then everything else can go to the cold tier and that will allow me to basically have different flavors of hardware we can tag this correctly with open search and then it will allow us to basically have you know what if even the same class same size cluster even without reducing its size but it's improving its performance because the nodes containing data that is frequently accessed do not suffer from noisy neighbors of less frequently accessed data and so on. So that's, there is a way to do it. There is another concept called a frozen tier. In Elasticsearch, it's, it's an actual tier. It's called frozen. In OpenSearch, we usually do, we, we call it searchable snapshots. Uh, anyway, the idea is that you ba you'll basically stop storing the data on the nodes themselves. It will reside on, let's say, Azure Blob storage. But then, when you want to search for uh, to search on it, you can still search it. There is a, a, a whole a feature in recent versions of OpenSearch that will allow you to basically execute searches on backups. Essentially, that's what it is. And so, obviously, it's something that you shouldn't be doing all the time but it still allows you to execute searches on things that are not frequently accessed at all. So uh, I don't know for, what do you call that? So when you need to basically allow to still have the data accessible, but uh, you need to keep it for five years back, but then you still need to somehow search for it. So instead of restoring, you can always search on the searchable snapshots as well. It's usually me meant for those things, but we do have some customers running that in kind of normal operation, when a customer sometimes runs a query for a year back, it will go in and leverage that, but they save a lot of money because they don't have to keep those on, on hot nodes.